Welcome to the MMA Fan Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Stu and Blake. Hello and welcome to the MMA Fan Show. I'm Stu Finn. Joining me always, Blake Harrison. How are you? Very good, mate. Very good. We're on a, a low budget uh, shoot today, aren't we? Are we just? I'm, is, holding, uh, I'm holding the microphone uh, in my daughter's bedroom. Um, and uh, hotel for you? Uh, no, I'm in an apartment in Budapest. Nice. Uh, I've Ooh. got some got some work going on, so I'm in the uh, Budapest apartment. Ooh. It's not too shabby. I say it's very rainy here, though. Very, yeah. very rainy. Um, yeah. So, yeah, just kind of making do. Got my phone propped up on a bunch of books and a bouquet of flowers are also helping to prop it up. So uh, that's how I'm <laughs> rolling. You're sat on... Some hey, it's just crowd. what's here. No, they're just what's here. It's like what's in the apartment when I arrive. Not for yeah. me specifically. Just, right. you know, it's, um, I'm pretty sure they're fake. Um, yeah. But, you know, uh, and you're just sat on the floor. I'm literally sitting on the floor. It's really uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> is it... As uncomfortable, I wonder, as being low kicked by Tom Aspinall. Tell me all about that, <laughs> Harrison, because uh, I saw some fantastic skits on the, the TNT uh, uh, sport uh, social media yesterday. So tell us all about that. Well, what went down there? So, yeah, no, I was a guest on Tom Aspinall's Fight Lab. And uh, because it were, they, they get people on uh, every week and. Um, they usually go over something to do with the fights that are upcoming or Tom will teach them a move or a guillotine or they'll roll around. I think most times I've seen it done, they're doing takedowns and jujitsu and stuff like that. But because it was Alex Pereira week, we were doing some low kicks. And uh, we were both wearing shin pads and I had one of those big square pads. And uh, Tom did a few low kicks on me. I mean, granted, I had all the pads and all that stuff, but... Even with the pads on, I'm not going to say like it hurt because you're, you're padded up and he's wearing chin pads and all that stuff, but you can really understand how badly it would hurt if he was just landing that on you without any padding. Dude, and the thing that pad and them two shin pads is not going to take all the sting out of a, a leg kick from Tom Aspinall, mate. Fair play to you, mate. <laughs> that, that must have been pretty powerful. It was. Do you know that the thing that's most scary about it was um, was his speed. Mm. He's six foot five. He's two hundred and sixty pounds or whatever he is. He he's so quick. Like Look. he's so quick. It you just you're just not expecting it off him. And he was only going like 75, 80 percent when he threw those kicks. And the other interesting thing was the difference between the low kick and the calf kick. And if you're someone that has um, uh, been training MMA for a long time or Muay Thai or something like that, and you you understand kind of the difference between them. As someone that's, you know, in my infancy, really, particularly when it comes to, like, taking shots. So, you know, I do my work on the pads and all that stuff, but when it comes to someone hitting me, I'm still very much, I don't really do that very often. I'm still surprised by it. Why would I want to get hit in the fucking face, mate? Or the leg, anywhere. Um, I'm not crazy. Um, but, the difference between the low kick attacking the thigh and the calf kick, again, even with the padding, you can just tell the difference. And the only way I can explain it is like with the low kick, there was like a hit and it was almost like a ripple in the water. There's like impact and then it kind of moves out into the flesh of your leg. And you know that, oh, that, that would freaking hurt if it was like for real without pads and all that mm. stuff. But then he did the calf kick. And with that, there's no kind of ripple. It's just thud. Just absolute thud. Because there's not enough muscle and flesh to take right. the punishment. So it's just, it just takes all of it. And it's just, just that kind of level of just And you're sudden, a really sort of thick set bloke as well, aren't you? As you can tell. Well, I made a joke about that. Like my, I, I made a, I don't know if I didn't make it into the actual show because I didn't watch the actual show, but. I said when we were about to go, let's just compare legs. And honestly, Tom's like another species to me. Like my leg is so, so skinny compared to Tom's legs. It was like a chopstick that he would just break <laughs> in half. Uh, he would pick his teeth with my leg. Um, so, yeah. I mean, of course, you've got to have a leg kick from Tom Aspinall. 
from the heavyweight champion of the world. Yeah, it's not Absolutely. bad. I kicked him a few. Uh, I kicked, again, I don't know if this made it into the show, but it, I, I was doing a couple of low kicks on him as well. And uh, Adam Catterall completely called me out because, like, the first one I did, and I was just like, oh, yeah, like little 50 percent. And then I, the second one, I was like, oh, I'm going to give it to him on this one. <laughs> I did like an 80 odd percent kind of like low kick on him. And I felt quite proud of myself. And even Catterall was like, oh, like that. And then the third one, I went back down to like 40% and Catherine was like, I know what you've done there. Because like the second one, you went for him. And because you know he's getting you next, the third one, you went, oh, I'm nice, really. The second one was an accident. That's how he called me out. Oh, love it. Love it. Well, look, we, we could we, we could talk about this all night because what, what a, uh, a, a, an amazing thing to, to experience. But there's some fantastic stuff to experience this coming weekend, right? Hell yeah, absolutely. We got um, Salt Lake City, which, uh, you know, UFC uh, UFC events, pay-per-view events in Salt Lake City have become a feature. It's where Leon Edwards did the famous uh, head kick in the fifth round to beat Kamar Usman. Um, it is uh, it's an interesting one because of the altitude. And how much of a factor that can play in fights. Funnily enough, we'll go on to it. But Jose Aldo fought Marab de Valistelli a little while back uh, in altitude. I believe it was on that Edwards, Edwards Usman card. Yes. And, um, you know, it, it played a factor. And there were heavyweight fights on that card that you could just go after about three, four minutes. These guys were absolutely wrecked. Yeah, It wasn't Salt Lake City, but uh, Tom mentioned this on the Fight Lab thing that, that you know, Tane Velasquez. Cain Velasquez fighting at altitude in New Mexico against, I think it was Junior De Santos. Like he gassed out very quickly. The king of Velasquez cardio. Was, it was, was the cardio king for heavyweight, absolutely. So, um, you know, if these fighters are not taking that into consideration and are not acclimatizing early to that altitude, we could see some very weird results. So that is always one to throw up there with a Salt Lake City card is do not be surprised if the underdogs win or something bizarre happens because if these fighters have not trained at altitude and taken this incredibly seriously, we could just see some wacky shit happening. I mean, so it's always a factor with a Salt Lake City card. Let's start at the top. And I, I mean, looking at this, Alex Pereira versus Khalil Rantry Jr. I don't think we're going to get into the championship rounds. I'd be amazed. Like, you, 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 you're probably right. I mean, first things first, do, do we need to address the uh, Ankalaev shaped elephant in the room on this one? Or well, he's, he's in the room. He, he's in the room, but they're not in that room. Like, no. He's in that room on his own. Like, everyone's left. Mirab's left. He's like, <laughs> guys, guys, it's right. pretty boring in here. <laughs> like, to see him there with like a little party hat for one, like, no, just on his own. <laughs> <laughs> Wild is the loneliest number that ever knew. Anyway, we'll get sued for that. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, look, we know that Ankalaev should be fighting for the belt. 100%. He should have been fighting for the belt a while ago. It hasn't happened. The UFC sort of needed another quick turnaround. They needed something exciting because for a long time, this was headlined by Raquel Pennington versus Juliana Pena, which was just not quite. Smoking up the barbecue. That's a phrase I've just made up. Um, so what we've yeah. got is not the right fight. Yes, it should be Ankalaev, right? Make no mistake. But the winners here are the fans. Because what we're going to get yeah. here is a way more fun fight, I think. Uh, yeah. I think we're going to see a really good striking battle. Uh, we've seen Khalil Rantree's striking just become something really, really devastating. Not a fan of the oblique kicks. You know, I know that uh, he, he, he's... Paul Modestus Bukalkas, yeah. Well, Paul Modestus, yeah. Um, but obviously we get Alex Pereira on a card. Now, Alex Pereira is not in boring fights. He's always in fantastic fights. He's becoming, if not the biggest star in the UFC now. Everybody loves him because he's got dynamite in his hands. And mm -hmm. he's not even got the most incredibly media-friendly personality. He's terrifying, and I think that's what yeah. causes so much interest. Like you don't know that much about him. You do see him dicking about with Glover a little bit, and it's hilarious to see yeah. him being a joker. But Jesus Christ, he's a scary individual. So is Khalil Rantry. Uh, I think yeah. you're going to see 
big, big fireworks in this fight. Interesting to see. I think uh, Pereira's probably got bigger reach. Uh, I'd be interested to see how that factors into it. I hope it doesn't go the distance and cardio starts to play its part in it. I'd just like to see some guns blazing them early two rounds and some go to Yeah. I think you've 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 kind of hit the nail on the head with with the Alex Pereira thing. He's he's not he's got something captivating about he the aura around him, and I wonder if it's just he fights regularly. That's really important fighting at a high level, but doing it regularly in MMA. It's very difficult to gain momentum when you fight every nine months. You know, when you're someone that is fighting as regularly as Alex Pereira, this will be his third fight this year. Let me. Um, let me throw something in the mix quickly. Go on. Let me tell you about a fighter that used to fight all the time, had no media personality whatsoever, was absolutely terrifying, and he's still one of the biggest legends in combat sports, Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson fought all the time, never really said anything. Was His personality was very similar, like when he made that ring walk, the, the, to, the, the Pereira's stone face, let's get down to business. No showboating. Like, I mean, the showboating of Alex Pereira, the closest he got was saying to Herb Dean, excuse me, don't worry about that groin shot. I've just got to quickly put this guy to sleep and then put him to sleep in the next shot. So I do think that we've we've always been interested by that quiet monster. And I say that with love. The yeah. you know, terrifying individual, Mike Tyson, no one knew what was going on there. You know, he'd fight all the time. And it was like, can't wait to see him fight because he's knocking everyone out. And he was just terrifying. And I think that's what we've got in Alex Pereira. That's it. Regularity combined with quick finishes can make you a big star in the UFC. But I think Alex Pereira does have more than that. I mean, he's got the, the kind of headdress and the kind of aztec kind of stuff going on. And he's got the um, uh, the, the, the shama. And he's got the 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 entrance where he's coming out like that, and he does the bow and arrow. Like he has got gimmicks and things that he plays off of the stone face emoji that he always uses. The um, what what's what's the island and what is, what is it that that's from? Um, those big stone heads. What is the? Oh, Not too sure. Oh, is it Aust- is it in Australia? Oh, I'll make it up. The, the big stone heads, the, the emoji that he uses. They'll come to me later. Right. Someone shout. Someone's shouting it down their phone yeah. right now as they listen to this. Um, oh, why is it gone from my brain? Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, so he does have a lot of personality to him. And as you say, he fights regularly, which is a, a, a real big factor there. He's, he's got so yeah. much uh, going for him at the moment. As you say, what, what, other than maybe Connor, John Jones, maybe Sean O'Malley, uh, He's he's got everything. He's the biggest iron. He's the guy that the UFC can go to and go. Can you help us out here? Three hundred. You weren't our first choice, but can you do it? Yes. Three oh three. Connor's out with a broken toe. Oh, you've got a broken toe as well. Yeah, but don't worry, boss. I'll come in and do it. Three oh seven's lacking. We call for him again. Um, yeah, it, it's going to be really interesting to see in terms of the Khalil Roundtree uh, stuff. I mean, he's a bit of an anomaly. He's got some some. Good wins, not great wins, but good wins. And he's got some slightly odd losses. And he just seems to, I think it was uh, uh, Pip, our mate Scrubius Pip, that it sort of likened him to Rob, the Robert De Niro of fighting, where he was sort of going, every time he comes out for a fight, he's a whole new person. One time he's a brawler, next time he's like boy karate fighter. Then he adopted the Muay Thai stuff. And that seems to be the thing that stuck with him. The Muay Thai, when he went to Thailand, he fell in love with it. And that's the, the fight style that really seems to gel with him and his athleticism and has led to now Khalil Roundtree being on, what is it, a five or six fight win streak or, or something like that at the moment. Um, I mean, he, he's, he showed, there was that, what I think the kids call it a cold finish, uh, where he... Um, was he knocked out basically Anthony Smith and when Anthony Smith was down, he was just over it with like the hammer fist ready to go, but showed mercy and didn't land it. But then Carl Roberson's probably watching that and going, how dare you show him mercy? When, when I was down, you were booting me, literally booting me in the stomach. Go back and watch the Khalil Roundtree versus Carl Roberson finish, and which will probably be on all the highlights surrounding this fight. As, as Carl Roberson is down, 
Khalil Roundtree is just smacking him in the stomach. Like if it if that hit his head, it would be an illegal soccer kick. But he was just soccer kicking him, but to the guts. It was so brutal, so so brutal. But yeah, he's uh, he's got so much power. And the other thing that's kind of interesting in terms of him fighting uh, Alex Pereira is he has defeated two former Glory Kickboxing World Champions. Alex Pereira, obviously, massive success, Glory Kickboxing World Champion. But he's Khalil Rauchy has defeated Dustin Jacoby on the feet, and he's defeated Gokan Saki as well, both Glory Kickboxing Champions. Now, there's Glory Kickboxing Champions, and there's Alex Pereira. So, you know, I don't know how much of a factor or how much weight we should put on those things, but a Muay Thai striker twice previously has beaten glory kickboxing champion. So he does have the skills to beat these people on the feet. It's just that Alex Pereira is not Dustin Jacoby and he's not Gokan Saki. I've spoke to plenty of people who think Khalil's going to get the win. I I can't see that. I've not seen enough of that yet. Like I, I, I think Khalil will be an underdog and I think rightfully so. Now, if he does pull something off, I will be a little bit shocked if I'm honest. I, I, I just, don't, I just don't think. I mean, he does. He is explosive, but I think the reach, the calmness, the the, the kind of championship mentality that those calf kicks. Although you know, I mean, Muay Thai style is a great way to check them, uh, but those calf kicks and and that, that left hook is just phenomenal. It'd be really interesting to see if Roundtree tries to wrestle because. If he can mix things up a bit and use his Muay Thai to get in and try to wrestle, even though it's not his forte, you never know. He, he could find himself on top and, and Alex Pereira will probably be a fish out of water. But if you instigate wrestling when it's not your usual thing in altitude, that is a surefire way to gas out quickly. Yeah, so yeah. maybe that would be a bad move. But it would be really it. interesting to see what Khalil Rauchery's game plan is in this night. I'd be interested if it stand up for round one. I'd be interested to see how how Khalil comes out in the second round because if he's yeah. if he's not put like Pereira away or he's been hurt by Pereira, I'd be interested if there's like a backup plan of like okay wrestle, like yep. because you, that guy's power is ridiculous. He's he's too good at what he does. Uh, you know your your stand ups. Uh, I know. I, I'm sure Cleo Rantry is very confident in his stand up. Like you say, he's, wherever he was at Tiger or wherever it was in, in, in Thailand, he's come back a very different fire, a very, very prolific striker. So I'm interested to see how it's going to go. I'm super hyped for this fight. Um, you picking Pereira? I'm going to have to pick Pereira. I've just, I mean, Cleo Rantry's best win is Anthony Smith. Mm. And for me, that does not compare. With Yuri, Yuri Prajka twice, Adesanya. Israel Adesanya, uh, Jan Blachowicz. Like, it's just, it's, it's not the same thing. Anthony Smith being your best win just doesn't, doesn't match up to Pereira's resume for me. That's why I have to pick Pereira, but <clears> you never know. Maybe Khalil Roundtree can do it. The big boys with big hands, mate. Let's see what happens. Who are you going for? What's your uh, official pick? I want Pereira to win. Uh, but I've just got a feeling Khalil Rantry might might put him to sleep. Do you? That's your I, official pick. Is you had picking I not Khalil seen, Rantry? Had I not seen the easy fight where Easy dropped him, I wouldn't have even considered it. But I know he can be stopped. And so, yeah, yeah I just think this could be Khalil Rantry's one opportunity. Yeah. No, that'd be, it'd be exciting. Be exciting. I mean, that's what's great about it. It's like it's a light heavyweight championship fight. Both big hitters, so all you're going to get is a great fight. Yep. Uh, um, shall we move on to the co-main event? Is this a great fight? <laughs> I, was, I was about to say, are you equally excited for any Ben yet? <laughs> no, of course not. Of course <laughs> not. Um, I mean... But let, me, let me say this. Raquel Pennington is on a six-fight yep. win streak. Yeah. You know, she's beaten Chasson, Aspen Ladd, Ketlin Vieira, Mara Bruno Silva... You know, prior to that, she had wins over Misha Tate and Irina Aldana. She has beaten some of the top, top, top bantamweights around. But 
Well, so why why is it that we're not kind of putting respect on her name? Why why are we not? Is is it because all of those wins bar one have been by decision? Probably. Or is it because we're all just expecting and waiting for Kayla Harrison to take the mantle that's been left by Nunes? Yeah, I mean, I I, I think we was, you know, a, a lot of fans, uh, dis, you know, really got into uh, women's MMA through. Ronda just disposing of everybody in a round. Uh, and then we just saw Nunes absolutely destroy everybody. We would get Joanna knocking people out and Rose head kicking people to sleep. Uh, and super exciting fights from uh, uh, Wei Li. And I don't know. I just don't think Raquel Pennington has got a fight style that really sells itself to fans. Now, yeah. it's not saying it's not effective and she's a worthy champ. Yes, she is. You know, you just rattled off a load of names there that are absolutely fantastic wins. Um, can she beat Juliana Penner? I'd be interested to see how she comes back. What's well, it been, two years out of the octagon? Yeah, two years for uh, Juliana Pena out of the octagon. This is a long time, and her last time she was in the octagon is when she, octagon is when she got absolutely smashed up by Nunes in the rematch. I mean, that wasn't even close. That was a proper one-sided beatdown. Yeah. So, yeah, be interesting to see how she comes back. But she, she does have some of the skills that Pennington struggled with before. Pennington has been in fights before where she is taken down, held down, pushed up against the fence, held up against the fence. I mean, again, it's not fun for the fans. It's not interesting. The ref's going to be there going, come on, you got to work, you got to work, and all that kind of stuff. But that is the game plan that Juliana Pena probably will have. Because it's something that Pennington has struggled with before. If you are physically, it's something Pennington's good at, and it's something Pennington's good at exactly. If you are, it, it would be so boring. But if Pena yeah. could just go right, I'm just gonna push you up against the fence, strike a little bit, grind it out, get you up against the grindy, just dirty, grindy, boring type fight up against the fence, couple of knees to the bodies, maybe slip an elbow in and still shoot back down to the legs for a takedown. Pennington's you're just stopping that takedown more often than not, but maybe she gets it down, then she gets back up to the feet, a couple of little blows like that while she's still trying to get single leg. Like, it, those are the kinds of fights that I think Pennington has struggled with and Pena can succeed in. So that's the type of game plan I expect Pena to have. However, altitude Pennington factors does, into this. Altitude factors into that. How good is Pena's cardio and has Pennington as well been preparing for that kind of fight? Because it is exhausting, that kind of fight. To do that and have that done to you is exhausting. But um, Pennington does do the fundamentals relatively well. Like She does have half decent takedown defense. She not great. She has, said she has been held down before, but she can grapple a bit. She's got fundamentals in her boxing and keep boxing. Again, it's not flashy, but six fight win streak, it gets the job done. So I'm very intrigued. I do, I do think that in terms of the bantamweight division finally getting a bit of excitement to it and intrigue to it, Pennington yeah. winning will be better. Because yeah. Pennington, I don't think he's great on the mic. Um, and her fight style is just kind of whatever. Yeah. Um, Pena is at least someone that keeps things interesting on the mic. Yeah. And if you've got Pena coming back after a two-year layoff and getting a win of, uh, over Pennington. And then, yes, we talked about the shadow looming over the, the, the co-main event, which is uh, uh, Kayla Harrison. Uh, you've got her. She beats Ketlin Vieira earlier that night. You've got a super interesting battle there where both women are going to really do their bit in the promo. The lead up to that fight will have a lot of interesting stuff being said. The, the kind of beef between them, I think, will will really uh, build and build up really, really interestingly. And I, I, I think the two of them on the mic actually makes the bantamweight division way, way more intriguing uh, and more exciting for the fans to watch, even if the fight styles aren't necessarily going to be overly exciting. You're still going to be uh, picking a side and wanting someone to win in in that fight, whereas I think with Pennington you won't necessarily get that quite so much. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, I think this is going to be quite a dull fight, and I hope I'm wrong. But yeah, 
I think we are going to see Pena do what Pena does and just grind out a, a very sludgy five round decision. Um, I'm I'm going to pick Pennington. I think Pennington's going to win it. I mean, I, I just think two years out of the cage and all that stuff. I I I think that might get to to Pena, and I just that last time we saw her in there, granted it was against Lunes. But she just got smashed from pillar to post. That's that's got to be a difficult thing to come back from psychologically. So I think Pennington has been relatively active again. Six five win streak. Um, I I think Pennington could could do well in this one. So uh, yeah, I'm picking Pennington. That's that's interesting. Both fights we've picked different people to win. Do you? Mm. Um. So I'm I'm looking at the uh, the running order on Tapology. Um. And it's showing that the fight uh, next is is Jose. Uh, have you got Kayla Harrison? I was assuming the next fight would be Wonder Boy and Buckley, but maybe actually now that I remember it, I think when I was on the fight lab, they said that was going to be featured prelim. It's fight. featured prelim. It is. It is. Well, I mean, surely that's the fight we most want to talk about, though, right? I want to talk about Jose Aldo, right? Go on then. Go on. Then. Why do you suddenly not like Jose Aldo? What's happened there? <laughs> I love Jose Aldo. That is Can't horrible of you to you say. You don't even want to hey, talk about him. If I have to choose between Jose Aldo and Mario Bautista or Joaquin Buckley and Wonderboy Thompson, I'm choosing Wonderboy. I love the NMF. Right. Um, yeah, we'll get to that. Let's work our way through, man. Because join him. Bautista, is this, I mean, this is a, a, a big step up for him. I mean, he's just come off the decision win over uh, Ricky Simon, uh, former guest of the show, Ricky Simon. Um, and I wonder, are we going to see if Batista sees this as his moment where he can really make a statement and be a legend? If that happens, is this the last we see of Jose Aldo? I, I hope not, because I think there's really obvious fights that I'm really frustrated by the UFC that they're not making these fights. I think they're booking Aldo completely wrong. I, as a fan, knowing that you know, Jose Aldo it doesn't, you know, he's retired once, he's come back. He, he's, I don't think he's got many fights left in him. So why are you putting him up against Jonathan Martinez and Mario Bautista? Because... If they win, we go, oh, Jose lost and these guys won, or oh, maybe that's the end of Jose Aldo. If Jose wins, we go, oh, Jose won. And then six months later, we go, who did he beat again? Who was yeah. it that Jose Aldo yeah. beat? I can't remember. Jonathan Martinez or the. Go, look, put we're him against, win. No, no, but put him against Dominic Cruz. Look, we've put been him against saying Henry it. Cejudo. <laughs> we've been against for like three it. years now, haven't we? No, no, no. But put him against that now that he's not. He, he, I know he's got, he's got an injury and everything he's got to come back from, but put him against Sean O'Malley. Like, these are the guys I want to see Jose Aldo fight. I don't want to see him fight the number 10 rev guy who's on an absolute tear that is, you know, uh, still not a name. No one really knows who they are. I want him to fight Don Cruz and Cejudo and now I'm Ali. And people are like, they are fun fights with a I legend. I don't know why in them. they're not doing and, it. And still have implications. Like if Joe Tejeldo beats Don Cruz or beats Henry Cejudo, he's up there in the top five for a title shot if he beats Cejudo or something like that. So, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't get it. I don't like the booking of it. Having said that, I mean, Aldo still definitely has a chance to win because he's still so, so very good. And, uh, Bautista is good everywhere, but his main thing is to take you down and use his jiu-jitsu. His jiu-jitsu is very, very good. It's a bantamweight. Again, this is a bantamweight. Um, it, it, Bautista's on a six-fight win streak. Um, as you pointed out, best win's probably Ricky Simone, who we've had on the show. Um, out of that six-fight win, win streak, three of those wins were by stoppage, and all of those were by submission. Um, so I think the big question is, can he take Aldo down and get him into his world? If he can, it might be a difficult night for Aldo. But if Aldo's takedown defense holds up, and let's be honest, Aldo's takedown defense is one of his best attributes. If he can keep it on the feet, I think he's got an excellent chance. Let's just hope it doesn't go the way of Marab Aldo at Salt Lake City in altitude, where 
Marab was just spamming takedowns, spamming takedowns. Again, Marab is a cardio freak, so he was able to do that. But I would, I would like to see Jose Aldo keep it on the feet, land some of those big left hooks to the body and those low kicks and things like that. And, uh, and yeah, and, and show everyone that he's still the king of, of Rio and maybe hopefully Salt Lake City as well. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that is what I, I want to see. But I definitely think if he loses, you can still make the Cruz fight and you can still make the Cejudo fight. That, those are ones that I think it would be a shame to never see Cruz Aldo. Okay. Um, look, I know you want to talk Wonder Boy, but can we talk about Ketlin Vieira um, versus uh, Kayla Harrison? Because as you said earlier, yep. in, you know, in the show, this has huge implications. Um, because yep. look, all eyes are on Kayla Harrison. I think more people are interested in watching Kayla Harrison fight than they are watching Raquel Pennington fight. Um, because well, we're seeing, you know, something very exciting coming to the UFC that, He's, he's looking terrifying. Uh, and we want to see, we want to see, you know, can she really do it with the elite level? Um, is Ketlin Vieira elite level? I wouldn't call Ketlin Vieira elite level. I'd have to she's go got, through she's her She's got a lot of in, obviously. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say that Ketlin Vieira is elite level. I do think she's very... Good wins over Misha Tate. Um, Kian said, um, yeah, I, I, I think Kellen Vieira is good all round, she can grapple well, but the obvious path to victory here is gonna be keeping it on the feet because Kayla Harrison only wants to do one thing, and that is take you down and smush you. Um, so yeah, she needs to smush you. Sm- yeah, smush you, baby. If you go with smush you. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I I think the bit the big thing is to try and keep it on feet. It's gonna be really interesting to see again, altitude. We keep mentioning it, but it is a fact that Kayla Harrison was a champion in the PFL at featherweight. No, lightweight, at lightweight, not even featherweight. She was the champion in PFL at lightweight. And she is now fighting at bantamweight. That is a huge, huge cut. If that cut doesn't go well. Now, again, she's won two two PFL tournaments. She should have millions in the bank, do really well. And um, she should be able to pay for all of the best nutritionists and acclimatizers, whatever you call them, for for fighting altitude. So she should have all the bases covered. But if she doesn't on that weight cut, Ketlin might only have to get out of the first round. Mm. If she can just survive the first round, it's going to be super interesting to see what Kayla Harrison has in the gas tank in rounds two and rounds three when she's making that sort of cut at that altitude as well. And it's really interesting. I just I don't know if we needed this fight. And I'm 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 not fully sure why the UFC have done it. I mean, we knew why they brought Kayla Harrison in. They brought Kayla Harrison in to save the bantamweight division because people were losing interest, and she is a star. Did did they give Kayla Harrison this fight? Because she could have just beat Holly Holm and got a title shot. There's no one would have been that bothered. There was Raquel Pennington and Juliana Pena were saying stuff about it. Oh, she's only just turned up. She hasn't been here long enough. All that stuff. Fans wouldn't have cared. They wanted to see Kayla fight for the belt. So why did they make this fight? Altitude as well. It's, it's a real tricky one. Unless they were going, we don't want to give Kayla the belt after just one fight at bantamweight because if she wins the belt after one fight at bantamweight and then struggles to make weight after that, we could have shot ourselves in the foot. And then what have we got? Do we have to bring back the featherweight division for uh, something like that? I don't know. So maybe they've thrown it at her as another way of her proving herself and particularly proving that she can make the weight. I'm not sure. So it's an interesting one, but yeah, if you're Ketlin Vieira, keep it on the feet and get through the first round and you yeah. see where you're at. Um, the first fight on the main card, I haven't got loads to say about it. Uh, Roman Delidze versus Kevin Holland. I'm sure it'd be a fun fight. Kevin Holland's 
generally uh, fun to watch. And uh, and have you got anything you want to add to this? I I've, I worry that this won't be fun. I think if you're Roman Delito, you're just going to take him down and, and yeah, yeah. try right. and beat him up down there. Um, so, I, I mean, Holland's got good jiu-jitsu, but we just saw Delete fight at light heavyweight. He's a big dude. Right. And uh, again, like with Kayla Harrison, he's going to try and take him down and smush him. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I think, think that goes in, this could... In the altitude, sorry. Yes, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm favouring yeah. Delete in this one, especially if he can get his hands on him. But uh, I'd like to see Holland win, something. I think Holland's fun. Okay. <laughs> Excuse um, me. <laughs> so, topping the prelims, uh, 170, we've got Joaquin Buckley versus Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. Um, why are you so hyped about this? Are you so hyped about this just because it's Wonderboy and we love Wonderboy? A little bit, yeah. I mean, look, I have to say, I'm actually, I'm hyped about what it could be, but I'm cynical about what it could be. What we could be getting... Is Wonderboy Thompson, who's one of the best strikers the UFC's ever seen, incredibly fun and striker, versus the guy that knocked out Impa Kasanganai with that spinning, jumping back kick while one of his hands were being held by uh, Kasanganai. Mm. One of his hands, one of his uh, feet were being held by Kasanganai. It's my favorite knockout of all time. I love that knockout so much. It's like something from a film. Um, so what we could be getting is two brilliant strikers going at it, which would be really, really fun. One's more explosive, one's more technical. It'd be great. However, in uh, Joaquin Buckley's last fight, we saw how he's improving his wrestling. And he was able to take down Rusibayev really, really easily, really, I'm going to say. Um, it was very explosive. He was just shooting those blast doubles. It wasn't the most technical wrestling you've ever seen, but it was effective. And Wonder Boy, as he's getting older, he's struggling more and more with people that take him down. Now, granted, Joaquin Buckley is not Gilbert Burns, and he's certainly not Bilal Muhammad when it comes to like wrestling technique and ability and stuff like that. But because he's so explosive and so athletic, and you've got to worry about the kicks in the hands as well with Buckley, I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm just wondering if he might be too much for Wonder Boy, especially if he can take Wonder Boy down. Um, it's a it's a big win for Buckley. Like it if, would be a huge if, win for Buckley know, if he gets that win. Then you know that that puts him you know up there in the mix of things. Um, I think if that goes the way you think it is, for me, Wonder Boy coming off a loss to Joaquin Buckley for me, then sets up the fight with MVP. I think like. It, that that's a good fight. Both coming off of losses, you know, do they make that fight? Oh, will they want MVP to fight before? And I suppose it depends. I hope the MVP fights sooner. I'd like to see MVP fights sooner because I don't think he took much damage in that Gary fight. It was a very close fight. And yeah, I, I don't think MVP came out of that uh, in any real way, as far really? as I'm aware anyway. So I'd like to see MVP back earlier. I can't remember who I thought MVP should fight, but I definitely think that there's fights out there for MVP that'll be interesting. Um, but yeah, you could do it. As MVP said when we had him on the show, he thinks that it will be interesting for him and for Wonderboy, mm-hmm. but it won't necessarily be interesting for the fans because there'll be so much just watching each other do fights and, and yeah. stuff like that. Um, but yeah, but it certainly be interesting. Um yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm really hoping we see two strikers going at it. And if they do keep it on the feet, I think Wonder Boy technically is superior. So he's just got to watch his chin because Wonder Boy very rarely loses to anyone on the feet. Anthony Pettis, he was beating up until that Superman punch off the cage, where he pushed off the cage, which was just, you know, a one in a million sort of shot. Uh, Well, maybe not one in a million if you're Anthony Pettis because he does shit like that all the time. Um, But it was very unique and special. Uh, And Wonder Boy was winning that fight up until that moment. Uh, And I think that's, Sort of, oh, the Darren Till one, but that was controversial. Darren Till won on the scorecards. People didn't necessarily agree with the scorecards. Also, Till missed weight by a long way. So that could have been a factor in that loss. So it's very rarely that you see Wonder Boy beat on the feet. Um, so if it stays there, he should have the skills to deal with Buckley's power. But if Buckley starts throwing in the takedowns, 
that's when things get a little bit grey for me and I'm not quite sure which way it's going to go. And I mean, is there many more fights that you want to talk about on the card? We can rattle off some, um, uh, purely because there's, I, I, I want to touch just before we wrap um, a little bit on what went down last weekend. Um, because uh, Oh, yes, we should, yeah. There was a couple of fights that I, I, I'd like to sort of mention. Uh, Marina Rodriguez, uh, he's fighting. Um, Yasmin Lucindo. Yeah, and, and obviously Carla Esparza versus uh, Tisha Pennington as well. So, you know, we should I mention think... it's Carla Esparza's retirement fight. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, and Tisha Pennington is going to be interesting because obviously she is Tisha Pennington now, no longer Tisha Torres, yeah. the wife of uh, Raquel Pennington. Yeah. So if Tisha loses or is seriously injured or anything like that, how much does that affect the champion? That'd be fascinating, really. Uh, being in the locker room, sure, and maybe even Raquel Pennington would be. Would she be cage solid for something like that? I don't know. Really? But um, if you are, are um, you know, if you are Tisha Pennington and you get injured, and then Raquel Pennington is like, "Shit, is, is my wife okay?" Yeah, uh, that's going to massively affect you in your title <laughs> fight. So. Yeah, that that for those reasons, it's going to be interesting. And Carla Esparza retirement. I mean, two-time uh, strawweight champion Carla Esparza never defended the belt, but she tried. She tried. Well, never successfully defended the belt. Yeah. She obviously fought Joanna after winning in the uh, uh, tough series and got absolutely battered. It was one of the first fights I ever watched where I was calling for the ref to stop the well, action. Well, it was well, so brutal. Never. Yeah. And then, obviously, she fought Zhang Wei Li after beating Rose in one of the worst fights of all time. Yep. She's got a colourful career. You think, inaugural strawweight uh, title, which was decided through the Ultimate Fighter series. Um, then she was beaten by arguably the greatest strawweight of all time in Joanna Ejacek. Then she has to build her way back up to a title shot. She got like five, six fight win streak at one point, has beaten a lot of really, really tough women on the way. Then beats Rose in the worst fight of all time by a lot of people's uh, estimations. And then loses to Zhang Weili, who again has got a case for being one of the greatest straw rates, if not the greatest straw weight of all time. So it's, it's a decent career for Carla Espars. Yeah, I mean, you, you've made it sound really colourful. But I'm just going to kind of fine tune it a little bit there to the, go, the, go on. <laughs> the bottom line is... Uh, Got one of the worst beatdowns ever in the history of the UFC and then also won the belt by being in arguably the worst fight hey, in the history of the UFC. Hey, do you know what the history books will say, my friend? They will say two-time UFC strawweight champion. Absolutely. And, no, and you know, That's and, all that matters. Like that series of tough was great. She looked fantastic. And yeah, uh, and, and also she just seems like an absolute uh, fantastic human being. So... Uh, Big, the Cookie big, Monster. Yeah. Good nickname as well. How can you look like the Cookie Monster? Absolutely. Uh, Alexander the Great Hernandez, who's not quite the great anymore. When he came into the UFC, he was one of the yeah. biggest, most talked about prospects. And, and he, yeah, it, it just went a little bit wrong. Um, but uh, Tim Means is fine on the card. Uh, we've also got OSP versus Ryan Spann. Uh, does anyone care about that? No, I feel like was that has that been rebooked? So oh, I don't remember really? that being on the oh, card. Maybe. No, like, maybe. no, I feel like it was actually on a previous card and has been moved to this one, but maybe I'm wrong. But yeah, you're Especially, right. Um, OSP Mobsar was meant to have fought Sterling on this card. Uh, that's what this card is missing that I would have yeah. been really excited about. If, if anything, this might sound weird to people. Mobsar versus Algerine Sterling would have probably been my most anticipated fight of the night despite the fact that we just had Lerone Murphy on that called both of them boring. <laughs> and he said the fight would have been boring. For me personally, go back and listen to our chat with Lerone Murphy. We just had it a few days ago. And uh, we talk about uh, some news and different things going on. So it's not just the chat with Lerone, it's the news and stuff as well. We get his insights into a few topics, but also he spoke a bit about uh, some fighters in the featherweight division. And he really was not a fan of... Uh, Mobsar or, or Aljamain Sterling's fight styles, he found them both yeah. insanely boring. And he thought the fight would have been really boring. But the UFC is very happy that that fight is now off the card. Um, I do disagree with that slightly. I find what he's saying quite funny, but I just need to know who had the better grappling. And 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 if Mobsar won, I think you would have to give him a title shot afterwards. Um, and the Aljamain Sterling story would be really interesting to see him trying to get a featherweight belt after 
you know, having issues with the UFC at Bantamweight, can he convince them to give him that title shot featherweight? Like, I think that would have been really interesting. So I'm disappointed that that's not on the card. Okay. Um, just want to sort of go back to some some bits and bobs that happened last weekend. Yes. Um, yeah. I've just I've just got an email through uh, confirming that Matt Frivola has just come back to planet Earth from uh, oh my a, god a, a different universe. Uh, you genuinely uh, had me there because I did get an email earlier about the UFC Paris event talking yeah, about yeah. Benoit Saint Denis about. And I was like, oh, shit, what's going on? And then you said Matt Favreau, and I was like, oh, no, has he got, like, some kind of horrific concussion? He's in hospital or something like that. You did have me there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. That was pure highlight reel, wasn't it? I mean, smacks of 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 Jose Aldo uh, yeah. in, in, in that spectacular knee. Um, I, I was watching but It was so high. It it's was like ridiculous. He had really flexible hips. He got his knee up to the guy's chin yeah. while he was stood upright. He wasn't there. Yeah. Like the, the other the other day, Aldo one that you mentioned was brilliant. It was against Chan Bet, Chad Mendes, yeah. right? And he turned around, but Chas Mendes was shooting him for a takedown when yeah. he got him. So he was like hit by and this well, guy. Chad, Chad, Mendes, was... Chad Mendes, he's like three foot seven. So it wasn't <laughs> like, I think he was the tallest guy alpha male. And like, <laughs> right. I think, um, uh, but, but yeah, I, he, that fella, like Faraz, uh, I mean, he's got pure Blake Harrison legs, hasn't he? They're proper gangly. He does. They? I, they're gangly long ones. And I'll tell you what, I've got some flexible hips on me, my friend. So <laughs> I reckon I could do, I could take that into the gym. Uh, Faraz the am, yeah. Um, clearly, <laughs> Matt Frivola does not like fighting Frenchmen. Then whilst Anthony kicked him into oblivion, and now Faraz the am as uh, needing into oblivion again, giving him a return flight. Uh, so, yeah, not uh, not great. Don't fight any more Frenchmen, Matt Frivola. No, absolutely. Speaking of Frenchmen, um, Cage Warriors uh, superstar Morgan Charrier continues tearing the UFC. Oh, yeah. Good uh, to see. Really fantastic uh, second round win over Miranda. Um, Brian Battle uh, got, the, got the win. Uh, and then... <laughs> paraded around the octagon, <laughs> yeah. giving everybody the finger. Uh, and was... It's so funny. He was like the baby face of uh, uh, the Ultimate Fighter series that he did. It was him, I think it was him versus, um, oh, who's the wrestler in the middleweight division now? But he's, uh, he's having a mixed career. Oh, I can't remember. Brady? What's wrong with my brain? No, no, no. Sure, Brady's well to wait. Uh, no, it was a. Uh, yeah, anyway, he's a big, big beard, great chest on him, very kind of masculine Henry Cavill-esque chest he's got on him. That's what I remember. Um, but anyway, I'll find his name in a minute. Um, yeah, Brian Battle was very much the baby face, and he and the other guy was the bad guy of that kind of finale. And um, yeah, now uh, Brian Battle was turned full heel, and he's, yeah. uh, he's going at the crowd, sticking up his middle fingers, and just like, Boo me all you want, and all this kind of stuff. Hey, hey. You know what? Like, I, I I don't know if he got in any trouble with the UFC for that. Uh, someone told nah, him. Yeah, I, don't love think it. I love it. Everyone loves a bad guy, and like, uh, and he, he he rose to the occasion. You know, he was never gonna he was never gonna be loved by the French crowd, and so he was like, right, how can I get the most attention and fun out of this? And yeah, and yeah, absolutely. Look, there was a you know, I, I wasn't overly. Andre Petrosky is the man I'm thinking of, and I don't. Yeah, Andre Petrosky is the man I'm thinking of. By the way, the uh, the guy who was up against in uh, the Ultimate Fighter. Right. Um, did you watch the Imovov Brendan Allen fight? I mean, you know that's a, a you know yes a, that's got serious implications. That fight. Um, I didn't think it was the most exciting fight. I thought it was pretty decent, but it it, it, it didn't it didn't blow me away. Um, I thought it was pretty good actually. Yeah. I thought because it was. Um, <clears throat> Did he get? I'm trying to think now. Did he get to? Um, my brain is not working today. Did he get to the to a decision? Yeah, he was it? Yeah, yeah, decision. He was by because yeah, Brendan Allen won the first round, right? Yeah, Quite he was a unanimous decision. Like, <laughs> yeah, and then uh, it looked like he might have got finished. I think maybe in the second round or something, but he, he didn't. Really? But, um, yeah, no, I, I thought that was an interesting fight. I thought maybe if I'm remembering it correctly, and I'm not sure that I am. Um, uh, was the third round maybe a little bit dull, but the second round was kind of where it was all over that's, him. That's a fair assumption. And he seated to, to gas out a bit. 
Um, but yeah, poor Brendan Allen, he was on a good run. But Nasadine Imovov looking very, very good and showing he's got a bit of Dagestani wrestling as well as his, uh, his French kickboxing uh, going on there. French kickboxing didn't seem to show up for Benoit Saint-Denis. Uh, oh. The headline fight. Um, I'm going to take nothing away from uh, Manny Moicano, but it looked to me that Benoit didn't show up. Like, I just didn't think he had much snap to what he was doing. Maybe it was just that... But Mike there was no chance for him to have snap. Good. True. He was taken down in the first, like, 10 seconds of the fight, yeah. and he had no answer, which surprised me. Benoit said that he, the decent enough wrestler, we saw what he did to Poirier and stuff like that in the first round of their fight. Them um, elbows, them elbows, mate. Oh, mate, it was brutal. He came out and he was just cut above that eye and yeah. below that eye. And of course, like his face was a bloody mess. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Moicano just looked like an absolute beast. And then second round, amazingly, the fight continues. And uh, Sandini won that round. I, I, he won I the think, second round. I thought Moicano knew he got that first round. I felt that he took his foot off the gas a little bit and maybe was saving something for the third. But obviously... Well, did you see the shoulder injury? My God. So if you haven't seen this on, on social media, turns out Moicano, I think it might have been in the first round, it's like he popped his shoulder out the... Uh, it was his shoulder out the socket or his collarbone. That something is completely broken or detached yeah. in his shoulder where it absolutely shouldn't be. Like the bone is like pushing the skin out in a weird way. Um, and if that happened in round one, if that fight is able to continue, you're thinking to yourself, maybe Benoit comes back and does it because he won the second round. Mm. But that first round was probably a 10-7, if not a, mm. definitely a 10-8, maybe a 10-7. Um, so, yeah, maybe Moicano just couldn't do much because of his shoulder. Mm. Um, so maybe for the both of them, it's best that that fight was stopped where it was because maybe Moicano could have injured himself further as well if he had to continue. Mm. Um, mm. And but, then, yeah, I mean, Benoit was just uh, – that that first round was just – he couldn't do anything. I think he could – After that, really, he was busted up. And then when the doctor put his hand over his right uh, – his left eye, I think, it was like he could Didn't he try and guess? Yeah. He, he, the doctor was like, how many fingers? He went, duh. And he was like, no. He was like, no, I can't see it. <laughs> I can't see and, it. Uh, and what was weird, hearing Bisping kind of commentating on that, just thinking this is the guy that, like – revised, you know, the eye chart so he could uh, fight with one yeah. eye. Uh, yeah, it was... Uh, it, Did it, he have a system with Jason Perillo? That's right. Where Jason be yeah. like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Uh, I mean, you can find out more about that if you want to go and check out our, our episode that we recorded with uh, with the can. And it's, uh, it's, it's great as well. He tells us some absolutely fantastic stories of uh, of what he was like before he, 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 he made it in the UFC. Just some real... Scary stuff that happened to oh him. Oh my because, god! Uh, yeah, he was, uh, growing up. Um, but then we got the call out. Uh, you're always intrigued to know what he's going to say when someone puts a mic in uh, in front of Moicano. He says he wants some easy fights. He says he wants Paddy Pimlet or Dan Hooker. Mm -hmm. Now, I I don't think anyone has ever said I want an easy fight. Give me Dan Hooker. Uh, but m maybe Arnold Allen in retrospect. But, uh, you know, Dan Hook is not an easy fight for anybody. Uh, and I don't certainly don't think he's an easy fight for Moicano. The no, fight's Paddy Pimlet. That's the fight that makes a lot of sense. Paddy's I a think so. Name. It's, it, it's a, I, I don't know where, um, where Moicano is now ranked uh, as of this week. I don't suppose it would have had huge implications because Benoit wasn't top 10, was he? Well, let's find out. Uh, Renato Moicano is 11, still right. 11. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, Paddy Pimlet is 15, so um, I don't know. It's an interesting one because of Moicano's injury. I think when we, we've, We've had Nathan Fletcher on the show uh, recently, and that will be coming out very soon. And I think they're alluding to the fact that Paddy might want to fight before the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So if Moicano's shoulder injury is bad and it didn't look great, then maybe he won't be available to fight at the end of the year. And he'll so, 
maybe a Benil Darius. Trying to think who else is above Paddy in the rankings. You, Dos Santos, is that a tricky fight for Paddy? Is I don't fighting? know. When's he fighting? He's fighting. No, has is, is, is RDA got a fight booked, has he? Sure he has. Sure he has. Maybe he has. I'll have to just find out. Mm. But, uh, but yeah, there's not... I think Moicano is the best bet, but... Uh, oh, I can't find it, so I can't... Don't even know. There's, a, so, there's so many Dos Anjoses. I've just put in Dos Anjos thinking it will come up, but it hasn't. Um... Uh, my my stuff's messed up now, so uh, it's not going to find it. So I don't know if Rafael Sosanios has a fight book or not, um, but maybe him or maybe uh, I don't know. RDA, I don't know. Yeah, RDA is fighting end of the month. He's fighting uh, Jeff Neal on the Tapuria card. Oh, he's he's gone up to welterweight. He's gone up to welterweight to fight Jeff Neal. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's not. There's not loads in it, is there? It's Jalen Turner. I think is a tricky one. Um, so I think Jalen Turner's fight style could be looking for. I say could be looking for Paddy's chin, but I would have said Bobby Green's fight style would have been looking for Bobby uh, for uh, for Pimless chin, and, and look what happened. Like, and I mean, I'm going through that. So Jalen Turner. I don't think the UFC would book that fight because I don't think there's enough in it for Paddy if he wins and if he loses, it takes all the momentum away. Dos Anjos is up at World Tway now. Benoit Santini, Renato Mercano, we've been over. They're just too injured. Max Holloway, no. Uh, Rafael Vasiv is, is still injured and I don't think they would make that fight. Mateus Gamera, I don't think they'd make that fight. Benil Dariush, maybe, but it's a tough fight, but certainly a maybe. Michael Chandler is now fighting Oliveira. Then you've got Dan Hooker, and you're in the top five. Do you do Dan Hooker, Paddy Pimblett? If Dan, I think, will want to fight up. I think he's trying to get Dustin Poirier. He's trying to get Justin Gaethje. I think Dustin was putting some stuff out on social media saying trilogy, like he'd like to fight Justin Gaethje in his final ever fight yeah. as a trilogy. I'd love that. You're Paddy, into that. I don't want to see. No, yeah, I'm all over that. I don't want to see Paddy yeah. fight. Uh, Dan Hooker. Uh, no, I'd rather see Dan Hooker fight above him, but who, who yeah. is that? So Rukian's fighting Makachev at some point. Oliveira's now fighting Michael Chandler. Horia and Gaethje may be angling to fight each other. So there's know. no one else above Dan Hooker. Conor McGregor. So he's got to fight behind him. If you're Dan Hooker, though, and you have to fight behind you, let me just list the names behind Dan Hooker. You have to fight behind you. You're Dan Hooker. Charles Glad books, can't be him. Benil Dariush, Mateo Scamrot, Rafael Fazeev, let's leave out Max Holloway because he's fine to Puria, Renato Moicano, Benoit Sandini, Rafael de Savios, Jalen Turner, Paddy Pimblet. Who's the fight you want out of all those fights? Benil Dariush. No, it's Paddy Pimblet. Sorry. Surely. You'd write, like, you if, if you're Dan Hooker. Dan Hooker. Yeah. Oh, sorry, if sorry, my bad. Yeah. yeah if um, you're Dan Hooker, you're fighting Paddy Pimblet. I, I guess there's right? the most. The most eyes are on that fight. The most eyes on that fight. And I think as Dan Hooker, you would go, I feel like that's a winnable fight for me. So I, I read something that Connor was saying that, you know, he'd fight Paddy. He thinks that'd be a great fight in the UK. I, I mean, listen, look, I mean, we saw a video recently of Connor looking like he was absolutely off his base. I mean, we don't know no, what he, he may or may not have said. Look. We hey, don't come know, on, man. That guy is was... straight as it comes. He, he's, he's never, never high, man. He does not look like he's fighting anytime soon, does he? <laughs> no. So, do you know what he looked know. like? He looked like a silly old drunk in a pub, just literally just talking utter nonsense. It was ridiculously embarrassing. And he was there just smoking weed, and it was like, oh, man, he's that. You know, there's, there's young fighters that really aspire to you, and like, well, look at what he's become. Like, not cool, man. Yeah, not. Well, it, I, I, Michael Chandler's clearly made the right choice to move on, isn't he? Because I mean, who knows how long he'll be waiting for Conor McGregor? So, yeah, I, I don't know. In terms of, uh, in terms of Moicano, if he can get fit soon, and that shoulder didn't look good, but if it is an injury that will get sorted, and he can fight by December, then I think Paddy will be in for it. Otherwise, 
I mean, maybe it's crazy, but maybe you could do Dan Hooker, Paddy Pimblett in December. Crazier things have happened. And if Dan wins, he goes, hey, I've fought behind me now. Now I've got to fight in front of me. And if Paddy wins, he's top five, which would be insane. So, yeah, big, big fight it could be. That's where it's going to be. I'll tell you what, I would, I would love to see it as well. Do you know what? I, I didn't even, yeah, I'm all over that now. The more I think about it, the more I'm salivating. <laughs> It's a big jump. I know there's a lot of people out of here going, Paddy does not deserve a top five fight. And I hear you and I understand. But I'm just thinking from a business perspective, if you are the UFC and you are Dan Hooker, who do you want to fight if you cannot fight above you if you're Dan Hooker? Because it does look like a lot of those uh, men are, are busy with other things. Then I think Paddy's, you're actually the most high profile winnable fight there is. Yeah. So there Fantastic. you go. Fantastic. Well, I think that's all she wrote for today's episode. And uh, and we'll be back with a post-fight show, as Blake mentioned earlier as well. Um, we've got a, a fantastic chat with... Um, uh, just got his first... His debut win in the UFC is made from Fletcher, uh, who fights out of Next Gen, uh, Cage Warriors superstar. And, uh, and he talks about his time in the Ultimate Fire House, the experiences of what that's like living in that house... Uh, and then we also get his thoughts on on what might be next for Conor McGregor, what might be next for Tom Aspinall, and 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 all the other exciting uh, things that are going on in the world of UFC. Um, other than that, big thanks to our sponsor, Fat Candy. Go use that discount code Sweet MMA, and that will save you money um, on your freeze dried sweets. Go check them out. Other than that, we done. We're done. Bye. Bye.